other phenomenal numbers to show. 2021 Roblox finished with almost 540 million in developer payouts. To remind our audience, developer payouts is the money that Roblox pays developer for their share of the total revenue of the platform. Listeners, welcome to the roundtable 35 of the Metacast. And today we're joined by Jan Raz Friedemann, Anton Gorodeski, and David Amor. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, our topics are going to be about Roblox earnings. We're going to go through Invest Games gaming deals, annual report, and Nintendo Direct. So, I don't know, we can start with some introductions. Maybe Anton, you can go first. Oh, wow. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to finally uh, uh, be on the pod again. So I guess now that Maria is the host, I may hope to, you know, appear more often <laughs> because Nico's been not very, like, inviting lately. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Invest Game, uh, apart from other things. Um so yeah, we're going to talk a bit about our uh, full year uh, 2021 report. So yeah, happy to see everyone. Yeah, good to see you too. Maybe next we can go on to David. Sure. Thanks. To, nice to be here with you, Maria. We actually met up earlier in the week at Pocket Gamer a couple of days ago. So it was, I met you in real life before I met you here on the pod, which is good. But yeah, my by way of background, I'm a longtime game maker, uh, recently jumped into the world of Web3 blockchain games, having fun doing that. Um, good to be back. First time I've been on the pod with Jan as well, so that's nice. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the pod today, Maria, and welcome to being a host of this wonderful podcast. Great to be here with Anton again. I think we did a podcast one time and then first time with David. Yeah, feeling of mutual. Great to be here. Again, I'm Jan. I'm a founder and CEO of Super Social. We're a uh, a uh, developer and publisher of metaverse games and experiences, initially focused on the Roblox platform and, and looking to expand to other platforms in the near future as well. Um, and yeah, great to be here again. Yeah, there's even photo proof. I was with David. No, oh, that's true. And and this is now being recorded as video as well. So that's we're sort of upping the stakes. Need to make sure that everyone does their hair on these podcasts from, from now on. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've embraced wearing uh, bright colors to pop Perfect. in video. Perfect. <laughs> cool. I think well, then we'll start talking about Roblox. Um, yesterday, they reported their fourth quarter and the 2020, 2021 fiscal year. So, um, Jan, could you give us a summary of what the report contained? Yeah, so I'll start with a bit of numbers first, just in terms of what Roblox accomplished in fourth quarter, fiscal year, full year 2021, and, and the highlights of January. And then there's a, a few kind of commentary points that I'd like to double down. I have a few notes, so I'll, 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 and then we can you know jump into kind of an open conversation. So just in terms of fourth quarter, um, Roblox revenue increased 83% in the fourth quarter um, to almost $570 million dollar. Um, in, in revenue, which is 83% um, uh, over year-over-year uh, over year growth on that quarter. The net cash provided from their operating activities um, in fourth quarter, $122 million, with free cash flow at $77 million. Uh, bookings increased in Q4 20% over year prior. Um, average daily active users at $49.5 million, which is an increase of 33% year-over-year. Uh, year. Um, they finished fourth quarter with, with 10.8 billion hours of engagement, an increase of 28% year over year, and an average booking per daily active user was $15.57. So these are the fourth quarter numbers. The full year 2021 highlights are revenue increased 108% from 2020 to $1.9 billion. Uh, really incredible growth. I mean, basically double, more than doubling Net cash provided by operating activities of uh, around $660 million with free cash flow for the full year at $558 million. Bookings increased 45% uh, from 2020 to $2.7 billion in full year 2021. Uh, the daily active users, as, as we said, they finished with $45.5 million 
which was an increase of 40% from 2020. Hours engaged, they finished with 41.4 billion, which was an increase of 35% year over year. And then the January matrix um, showing, uh, again, really solid growth. Revenue is going to be between 203 to $206 million, which is 65% uh, growth year over year from January 2021. Daily active users, almost 55 million daily active users, which is 32% increase from January 2021. So again, really solid growth. Um, and we're also seeing the bookings in between 220 million to 223 at a much higher, smaller increase of 2 to 3% year over year. Um, and so again, kind of the big numbers that I want to highlight, first of all, in January, they are showing almost 55 million daily active users. Uh, which was a really fantastic increase, double-digit increase from the year prior. Uh, also, other phenomenal numbers to show, 2021 Roblox finished with almost $540 million in developer payouts. To remind our audience, developer payouts is the money that Roblox pays developer for their share of the total revenue on the platform. That was above the $500 million that was sort of an initial estimate for 2021. Uh, what's really incredibly is that this is more than five times what Roblox paid just two years before to developers. And so you see the growth of booking, you see the growth of revenue, and that ultimately translate to uh, the developer payout increase, which crossed the half a billion for the first time. What I also like to highlight is during 2021, they were almost 2000 experiences and games on the platform that reached that generated more than 1 million hours of engagement. Um, in Q4 2021, they had an average of 12 million monthly payers uh, with almost 90% repurchase rate. And so that's pretty incredible. That's a really high repurchase rate for people who have purchased at least one time. So this is also another highlight uh, that I'd like to make. You know, we talked about the daily active users. We talked about the hours engaged. We talked about the booking. Um, I think Roblox have missed on the... Uh, estimates that analysts have had in terms of top line revenue and the earnings per share, which is why the sh the strike the share is declining this morning uh, at at over twenty percent uh, uh, decline of the price uh, of the sh of the price of the share, uh, which is obviously disappointing for uh, any shareholders of the company and of course for the company itself. But as you listen to Roblox, they are a very long term company. They're building something. Uh, pretty significant with an insanely engaged community of users. Um, and I've heard this morning Dave Bazuki, the founder and CEO, talks on CNBC uh, outlining that really the focus of the company is and continues to be uh, user growth and engagement growth. And I think on those two metrics, the company continues to make uh, headway. Uh, but definitely in the short term, they have a lot to prove in terms of uh, the financial fundamentals that uh, equity investors care about. So these are the highlights that um, you know we're seeing from the company this morning. It's very hard to take in those numbers <laughs> and how how can they achieve them? Uh, how how did they go about doing this? Like what's what's the secret sauce? Look, I think Roblox is it's a marketplace, right? Roblox it doesn't build content on their own. They, there are over a million creators and developers that build content on the platform. Um, and it's a completely sort of decentralized development model where people, anyone can really build content. So Roblox relies on, on sort of essentially a huge amount of a community of developers that are building content for the platform that doesn't cost Roblox any capital. The capital that Roblox invests is in the infrastructure, in the tools, in the cloud services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, you have, you know, 50 plus million uh, daily active users who are engaged uh, at an average, I think, of something like two plus hours a day of a daily active user oh. spending time of the platform. You're probably talking about something more than anywhere between 35 to 45 days a year that people, daily active users are spending time on the platform. And so the, the short answer is they, they've built an incredible marketplace for 3D games and experiences that are highly engaging for a large audience um, globally, not just North America, but also in international markets. Um, and I think that flywheel 
more developers means more, more content, more content, more users, more users, they invite their friends and so on and so forth. I think where Roblox needs to prove that they can grow is obviously have a sustainable growth of the revenue or the booking per uh, per daily active user, which I think is where a lot of equity investors want to see the continued growth. Um, and of course, making sure that the international audience can start to monetize way more effectively. You're still seeing a, a, a big portion of the revenue coming from the North American audience, even though it's the smaller portion of the daily active users. And so, you know, that relationship needs to really flip over time. And as you all know, international audience monetization is is not quite similar to North American audience who are traditionally spending a lot of money on digital products. Uh, and so it's still uh, to be seen how uh, efficient and effective and scalable the monetization of international users is going to be in the next um, in the next you know 18 to 24 months. Uh, Jan, I have a question. What what do you think? You're close to this world. Is there any of these numbers surprising for you? What what are the things that surprised you or surprised the market? Do you think? I'm I'm, I'm not surprised actually. I think what surprised the market is or or not surprised the market is is the fact that you know revenue per booking per daily active users have declined. But I think if you think about it. It kind of makes it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, user users continue to grow. You see more hours of engagement, and I think the monetization in international markets is slower than the one in North America. Uh, and so I think if you factor that international growth, if you factor going beyond COVID, which was incredible accelerated growth, if you factor the fact that the platform continued to grow with its daily active users in in really solid growth, I mean you're talking about twenty five to thirty percent user growth still. Um, I personally, as someone who operates on the platform and keeping a close eye on the on the company, I'm not surprised by by those numbers and. I believe that the most important thing to the company at the moment is continue to grow the user base. You know, they have an ambition of having a billion monthly active users. Um, I think they're probably, you know, they they they're probably at two two hundred and fifty million. It, these are not official numbers, but I would assume it's in the two hundred to three hundred monthly active users. And so they want to grow two, three, four times that over the next few years. Uh, it's really important to keep the eye on the ball, which is user growth. Users will grow with more content that is coming in. You want to monetize and incentivize the developers so they can keep producing more content. Uh, and then I think I wouldn't expect to see um, the revenue per the bookings per daily active users becoming the priority of the company at least for the next two to three years. That's just my my hypothesis. And do you think they're going to grow the users by um, targeting more the international market? Well, about. international market already comprises majority of the users on the platform. I think wow. the, the most recent numbers I've seen probably last year is that about 60, you know, two thirds of the audience of Roblox today comes from international, from non North America. Uh, mm -hmm. Their biggest markets are Brazil and Philippines and Thailand and Russia. Um, and, and, and I think that international growth will continue. The thing is the international audience, although it's about two thirds of the audience of the platform, they only account for about a third of the revenue. So you have a third of the users come from North America that account for two thirds of the revenue. That needs to start being more balanced over time because the growth of the user in the North American market is slowing down naturally because Roblox is already the dominant player when you talk about the younger demographics. I do think it's strategic for Roblox as well to continue and push for growing the audience of the, of the platform in North America in the more older demographics. But there you're competing against even more against YouTube and TikTok and Snapchat. Um, and I haven't seen yet Roblox doing brand marketing uh, at, at, at a scalable way to attract more people to come into the platform from off platform. As you can imagine, it's way more expensive to do that because you're competing against all these other social platforms and, and gaming platforms and, and so on and so forth. So I do think international expansion is key especially when it comes to the monetization per user in international markets. Why um, do you think... Oh, sorry, Anton, go ahead. No, no, you go. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's okay. Why do you think the uh, non-North American audience doesn't monetize as well? What do you think needs to happen to for Roblox to see the growth in, in their monetization? I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a great question. Uh, you know, first and foremost, the... International markets, when it comes to digital products, digital subscriptions, spending 
spending money, especially when it comes to young people, there is a there is a cultural difference from North America. If you look at a if you look at a market like the United Kingdom, if you look at the Asian markets, uh, if you look at Brazil and Russia, the behavior with digital monetization is just very different than North America. North America is the epicenter of digital spend. Um, obviously, I'm excluding China, which is a whole different thing because Roblox is not even really active there at the moment. Uh, and China is definitely a country where monetization works. And so I think there's just cultural differences. I'm sure Anton can talk to that to some extent on what it's like for young, you know, under 18 year olds to monetize on digital subscription and digital products and app store monetization in a country like Russia. Um, but I think there are cultural differences. And I think also, I, I, I think it's also about the content, right? I think it's important that Roblox finds a way to encourage and build developer communities that are creating more and more and more content internationally as well, because I think there is better chances for local content built for local audiences to potentially monetize better than content built in North America for a international audience. But I don't think that necessarily going to change the cultural differences when it comes to monetization in these countries and the difference between that and North America when it comes to young people spending money. Um, if I may add that apart from cultural differences, uh, there's just this, uh, this thing, which is, um, you know, economic sustainability and obviously the U S, uh, and the thing that Yon has been talking about that, uh, the U S audience is better monetized comes directly from the fact that the U S is just a richer country. So, um, when you talk about expanding globally, uh, into countries like Brazil, Russia, Philippines. Um, of course, there's lots and lots of uh, young audience uh, eager to play and to spend their free time there in Roblox or any other competitor. Uh, but they just do not have money for that uh, very often. So uh, the question I was about to ask is uh, last year, I heard that Roblox was thinking about implementing some new monetization mechanics apart from the, you know, from the basic ones. So are there any news on that? Like, does that work already? Uh, if they have already done that and well, or they haven't. So how are they exactly uh, thinking about monetizing that new audience apart from like the basic stuff? Yeah, I, I am not aware of what tests the Roblox might may have been doing internationally. I think there is sort of um, definitely on the developer side, Roblox introduced last year the premium payout, the engagement revenue that is actually a pretty significant revenue stream for developers. But that has nothing to do with what the users actually that is directly correlated to the premium subscribers. So the the engagement revenue is basically money that Roblox makes from people that subscribe to the Roblox premium offering. So for example, I have a premium subscription. I pay $5 a month on the Roblox platform. Roblox takes that pool of money and distribute that in the form of engagement revenue or some of that in the form of engagement revenue for the developers. And so I think one of the key things that Roblox uh, is focused on, I'm certain strategically, is increasing the subscriber pool on the platform. Um, and again, I think, Anton, to your point, that still very much applies to the, the, the richer countries, right? Western Europe, uh, North America, um, less, I believe, to the emerging economies or the economies, uh, developing economies like, you know, uh, Indonesia and Philippines and Thailand and, and Brazil, uh, where the purchase power of the consumer and the household is obviously uh, much smaller than the average household in, in a country like you know, Britain or, or the US. Um, and so I do believe that engagement pay up, the premium subscription is an important strategic vertical of growth of revenue for Roblox. Uh, but I still do believe it applies more effectively to the richer countries, to the developed countries. Um, and also it applies more to aged up uh, demographics, right? Above 13, uh, people at 15, 17, they, they start to have their own phone, their own wallet. Uh, and are less dependent on their parents than a eight or nine or a 10 year old. Um, and so to be completely honest, I am not certain at this point what 
is the trajectory of how Roblox really expand internationally. But I do think there is a difference between a country like the UK and, and a country like Russia, uh, different economies, different purchase power. Uh, so I do suspect that at least in the coming years, uh, Roblox's revenue will continue to come primarily from the developed countries, US, Canada, UK, Western Europe, right? Places like France, Germany, and so on and so forth. And the lesser revenue, Australia, New Zealand, and the lesser revenue, the smaller portion of revenue will come from the developing economies because I just think it's a, it's just these countries are just not at the same place as the developed countries and their consumers are not there and it's going to take time. Um, and, and I think that definitely something Roblox will likely need to introduce more revenue opportunities from their core demographics and their core audiences who come from the developed countries, at least in the near future. I was uh, going to dig into that $500 million payout to developers, which sounds like a big number, it's a big number, but you said they were, it's interesting, first time I heard that number, that there's 2,000 popular games, or I don't know quite how that's defined. So that's $250K per uh, game per year. And in, in a sense, considering there's 50 million people on that platform, that feels quite low to me. And I wonder whether or not the fact that even if Roblox platform uh, are deciding they care more about players than they do about monetization, if you're building on that platform and hoping for monetization, then that doesn't work for you particularly. So it, it was 250k just doesn't, uh, if you're running a studio, that just doesn't take you very far. I know that's something you're deep in, Jan, but uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, you're 100% right. Uh, you know, uh, definitely that level of revenue is not compelling to a professional company that is coming into the platform. It's great for a small developer or a small shop that, you know, have their own business. Uh, it's definitely not compelling for a venture-backed company like Super Social. Uh, that's not what's going to keep us and allow us to continue and invest in the platform. And obviously, that's not why we came in. Uh, you know, we want to do much, much bigger numbers. I do believe that that's just the nature of the Roblox platform at the moment. It's primarily, you know, it's a younger audience. M majority of the audience is under 18. Um, it doesn't monetize like mobile gaming uh, or iOS based games. Uh, all the matrix are just much, much, much different. There is big, big volume of people, big volume of time spent from a monetization. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a less efficient way of making money, but also the unit economic is different, right? To build an experience on the Roblox platform in 3D, you spend a, a fraction of the time and the cost of building it in in other platforms like iOS or Unity or Unreal, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, when you think about the unit economic of your business, you need to take into account not only what revenue you can get as a developer, uh, but also what is the cost structure of actually building these experiences and you know, you need to what, see how do you build is, a sustainable business. What it, what it, you meant? You are venture backed, and and so therefore, what is your strategy? Is it, is it to uh, to out index those the, the other people making games there and just having experiences that are uh, see more than two hundred fifty k? Is it just by bringing more players, or is it by monetizing those players better? How do you approach that as a professional in the space? Yeah, look, our our I mean, you know, I. I will say this, we are still figuring it out, right? We're 18 months on the platform and this is a really unique platform uh, in terms of what type of games people like. Our goal is really to build the most iconic IP um, and, and, and build brand franchises, not just game. And then when you build a brand franchise, you're able to monetize that beyond the revenue of the game itself. Um, and, you know, we're already pursuing some initiative related to that strategy that I can't yet disclose. But, you know, we came into the Roblox platform not just to build games, but also the belief that uh, some of the most amazing brand franchises from the gaming sector uh, can be born on a platform like Roblox. If you think about it, you access an extraordinary amount of audience and users who are at a certain demographic. And um, thinking about the possibility of revenue just from the narrow lens of the game is is not our approach and is in my mind not going to be sufficient unless you become a juggernaut of a game uh which is possible but obviously you know it's very hard to build game hits as you all know um if it happens it can generate astronomical revenue on the platform you have games on roblox that generate 10 15 20 million dollar and more a year in revenue uh, it's a small fraction of the developer 
ecosystem on the platform. Uh, I don't know the percentage, but I wouldn't be surprised if 80 to 90% of the revenue on the platform is 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 made by you know 10 to 20% of the developers. That's pretty much what I would expect. Um, and so at the end of the day, as a venture back company, you know, our goal is to build the most iconic IP and prove that we can build attractive, compelling businesses uh, on top of that IP. To the to the point of Yon, uh, Roblox does seem like a way longer strategic thing and investment uh, opposed to like the quarter or half like half year metrics. I mean, uh, those guys are the closest to the, the to the metaverse or whatever, right? Uh, to the thing that half of the digital entertainment is now like hyping about. And uh, it does seem like an investment to the five to 10 to 15 year future, right? So uh, uh, what, what you uh, when Jan is talking about IPs, uh, it does seem that uh, when you build on Roblox, you are not there for the, like on the spot return on your investment. You're playing the long shot game here because you're building some things that um, the audience, the kids mostly, are interacting with uh, for the long period of time. And so they're going to come back to it. They're going to get back to it later when they are more economically capable. So again, it seems like it's mostly about engagement and long-term IP rather than you know, getting average revenue, uh, like the inc- the increase of uh, average revenue per user, uh, which you like do seek in mobile games, for example. And 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 I think it's really important for the for the company in the long term to retain the users. Like one of the I think one of the key success factors in my mind for Roblox is being able to retain the users as they age up. So when they are 15, 18, they don't leave the platform. They stay in the platform. And I think this is a big ambitious. This is a big ambition. Uh, I think it's possible, uh, but a lot needs to happen for that uh, uh, eventuality, especially on the content front. Uh, Roblox become needing to become more of a avatar-based social network that players want to continue and interact where they make friends and they stay on the platform. Um, but I do believe that Roblox's long-term success really hinges also on their ability to not only monetize the international audience, but also to retain the users that they have in the core countries uh, that are being monetized, uh, especially North America. Uh, yeah, I think it's I super critical this, that they retain that users. We've talked on this podcast at all about the fact that they talk about aging up. I always think that's easy to say, much harder to really do. You know, I think uh, if if kids perceive a game as being something you do when you're kids, then that's quite hard to reverse. I guess, on the other hand, if you've got friends there, particularly friends that you don't know in real life and have connections, then, you know, even if uh, it is looked down and considered a little younger, then maybe people stick with it. I wonder, I'd love to know some numbers about whether or not, you know, how much churn they're seeing and whether or not that increase in DAU is new players or whether or not to retain players plus new players or, you, you know, what the maths are of that. But I, I guess we haven't seen that. I would love to see those numbers as well. I do not believe <laughs> yeah. they publish those numbers. No, but sure it's a great question, uh, yeah. David. It's a great question. Yeah. It almost feels like a chicken and the egg situation where to capture a more mature audience, they need different types of games on the platform. But then because you don't have that audience, that type of game developer probably won't risk it to develop games on Roblox. Do you think that's maybe why they're um, investing in creating these brand partnerships and bringing, for for example, McLaren Racing and NFL into the game to attract attract a more mature player segment to the platform? I, I, I think these are good uh, opportunities for uh, driving awareness to the platform. Um, I don't think that's what's going to pe- keep people on the platform. I don't think that an NFL experience is going to keep people on the platform. Uh, I think it's a great awareness generator. Ultimately, what's going to keep people on the platform, I believe, as they age up, is just exceptional content, exceptional games, 
and exceptional opportunities for people to interact and socialize and experience things together on the platform. And for that, you need amazing content. You know, as super social, as a developer and publisher of, of, of content on the platform, you know, we very much put a lot of focus on these aged up content. Um, I think Roblox is putting a lot of focus on that and they recently launched the Game Fund, which is basically uh, provide grants for developers who build aged up content. But you know, these things take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Well, uh, and so it doesn't have you know, to be I mean, you're alluding to it there, it does, but it doesn't have to be games, right? So content could be, I'm thinking about Fortnite that's doing every other grand uh, gigs there that people are showing up for that rather than to play the game. And the experiences that people go to play Fortnite can be pretty varied. So I don't think content is really going to be just about games. And maybe they do need to lead to lead with that stuff, Roblox themselves, in order to age it up to give people different reasons to hang out there. Well, well they games. do in their own way. Um, okay. And by the way, as a side note, you know, I don't look at Super Social as a gaming company. I've never mm -hmm. thought of Super Social as a gaming company. You know, we're a metaverse company. We're building games and experiences for the metaverse. I think games and gaming will continue to be a dominant use case in, in, in platforms like Roblox and others. And I think that's okay. Um, and, and to your last point, David, yes, I think Roblox is doing things in that regard, like the game fund, like these brand partnerships. But Roblox doesn't develop content on their own. All of these things that we're talking about, these are experiences that ultimately are built by developers. Uh, and I think that's the uniqueness of Roblox um, and, and why Roblox is not a game company. It's, it's a platform. It's a social platform revolving around 3D persistent uh, virtual experiences. A lot of it is games, but I agree with you. And this is why I'm so excited about what Roblox is doing alongside other companies is that they are building the infrastructure where all sorts of 3D persistent virtual experiences can take place. Uh, fashion and music and sports and games and commerce. And I think it will happen. It will come to life over the next three to five years, which is why, again, um, keeping a long-term view on what Roblox is building um, and making sure that what's really important in my mind is user growth, engagement, retaining the users that are aging up and making sure that there is a diversified content portfolio that will help retain those users. Uh, that will give Roblox a better chance of not only monetizing, but monetizing more sustainably. Uh, I believe if you would ask Roblox, I suspect they would rather have retained users as they age up and then find more ways to monetize them as they age up than optimizing now to get as much money as possible from them while they're on the platform. To me, the, 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 the former is kind of the more strategic um, undertaking. There is... Oh, sorry. I'm, I, would, I just wanted to say that there is, though, uh, this maybe not threat, but... Um, this thing that if you want to retain your audience, your younger audience, uh, and wait for them to get older and to still be on Roblox, uh, especially if you want to build the metaverse in one way or another, you have to provide a certain quality level of experience because the older audiences are more used to, you know, uh, I'm not talking about quality production, but anyway, to more uh uh to, to you know to those experiences that uh offer um better quality of gaming if we're talking about games or whatever so uh uh the older the gamer is he prefers to, to you know to play some other games like what call of duty whatever battlefield right mm -hmm. um so if you want to retain users on a platform which roblox is mm -hmm. Uh, you have to provide this level of production or even higher. And to me, the question is whether they will be able to do that just in time for those uh, people who are now uh, active on Roblox uh, to grow up. And I also wanted to like ask you, there's been recently some news about some, you know, not so... Uh, not, uh, it, there was some nasty stuff happening on Roblox. So you have dropped the link earlier. 
So I know this has probably nothing to do with the recent results, uh, but anyway, is there any development on that? Like maybe some news uh, of what Roblox is going to do with that? Well, look, I think there is a wide issue with regards to internet safety for kids and young people on the internet. I don't think it's an exclusive problem to sure. Roblox. Um, and so, but yes, I think the news that came out is obviously uh, disturbing. Um, and none of us want to see these type of things happening. Um, obviously, it's a small uh, fraction. It's a it's a fraction of of of, of what the, the activity that is happening on the platform. Uh, I I do know and uh, that Roblox puts a lot of effort and investment in in safety uh, on the platform for kids, and things like that are bound to happen. Uh, I don't know how they're going to completely terminate those type of things from occurring again. Uh, but again, I think there is a bigger issue on how do we build safe digital environments for kids, um, providing access to kids to the uh, the beauty and the possibilities that the internet and technology enables, but without putting them at potential harm. And these are worrying cases. And and uh, I don't think it's reflected in uh, it, it damaged Roblox in any way in their results, uh, in the revenue or the share price. Uh, but nonetheless, it's it's a wide internet issue. In especially as something that the metaverse, these kind of large real-time 3D environments will need to address uh, if it's Roblox or others, and in this case, Roblox. And I think it's important to address it. And I'm sure they, they are. Um, and so, um, and we're trying to contribute with, with the tiny <laughs> way that we're able to contribute as a company. Yeah. Thank you, Jan, so much for summarizing the numbers of the fourth quarter and, and the fiscal year. That was really interesting discussion. Um, look forward to seeing what the first quarter of 2022 holds for, for Roblox. I think we'll we'll move on to Invest Games annual report. And Anton is the co-founder of Invest Games, so who better to talk about the summaries of their findings? Do you, do you want to go ahead, Anton? Sure, sure. I'm I'm just going to go and uh make it like as short as possible because we were already talking <laughs> for quite some time. <laughs> and uh uh I know at least one person who's not a fan of that. Um anyway, yeah, we've just released the full year 2021 report uh uh in regards to like all the global gaming deals and that's the second annual report we did. So the first one was back in 2020. Um, and one of the major findings of that is uh, 2021 turned out to be another record smashing year uh, for the for the industry we all work in, uh, with the closed deals value surpassing 71 uh, billion dollars, which is more than a two times year over year growth, uh, and that 71 billion dollars uh, happened across. The amazing number of 937 deals. So that's a 1.4x year over year growth. So uh, in 2020, we counted 673 deals. So uh, the numbers speak for themselves, for itself. And uh, that's for the closed deals. So these are the deals that has been announced and closed uh, or just closed in 2021. And we also counted uh, 30 deals which were announced, but not yet closed uh, in 2021. So they um, add up uh, somewhat 30, uh, um, sorry, not 30, 30 deals uh, uh, add up $9.1 billion. So- I, Anton, that, can I ask a question? The, uh, sure. So when you're talking about these investments, are these all, are these VCs and private equity? That, that's what yeah. you're counting. So it's not bigger companies and it's not like Activision investing in companies. It's Yeah, like the thing is that the companies. thing is that that's the whole value of M&As, VCs and uh, public offerings. So okay. and the, the amazing thing about the industry, uh, about gaming, is that January 2022 uh, has already like smashed that value because the ATVI and uh, Microsoft deal is, as you all know, $68 billion with like some something. Uh, add this up to take two and Zynga deal and uh, Sony and Bungie. And we already, the January of 2022 has already smashed the whole 2021 deal value. So that's amazing. 
But again, it's not like you have this uh, scale of the deal every time, right? No, there um, can't be that many. But what, so you're saying in 2020, what was it? There were thereabouts. You said uh, uh, there were 663 deals, and the total value was um, so. If it's a 2.1x growth from 71, it was something like 30 something billion dollar right. thing. Right. 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 So, so you, you can imagine it doubling again in 2022. For so sure. If, for sure. At anything, least doubling. Still, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the market is going crazy and the market, there is so much free money and uh, there is so much growth uh, in gaming and obviously uh, platforms like Roblox adds a lot to that because more and more people are getting engaged there uh, uh, into the experiences these platforms provide. So we're not just talking about like mobile games or console games or PC games. But again, uh, a lot has been contributed by blockchain and let me just uh, check the stats. But the funny thing is that, uh, uh, so we divide all these deals into three major categories, which is, as I have already mentioned, uh, like the exit activity, M&As, uh, public offerings like IPOs and SPACs, and VC uh, and corporate private investments. And so private investments, they doubled in the deal value. So 2021 saw, 12 billion dollars uh, of that 70, 71 uh, uh, figure that I mentioned. And um, uh, uh, one of the things that we have noticed in these um, private uh, placement sector is that uh, a lot has been contributed by the investments into the blockchain gaming. So the segment uh, occupied 26% of that private investment, right? So we have $12 uh, billion dollars invested uh, by the VC funds, by the corporates. And so 3.1 billions of that value uh, was put into blockchain gaming ecosystem. That's not only games, but also like service providers like Forte and, um, um, you know, Solana, uh, all those guys. Yeah, so blockchain gaming had the absolute breakthrough and the total value blasted off 68x uh, year over year. So again, just imagine we had $3.1 billion in 2021 and only uh, $46 million, million dollars in 2020. Wow. I've got, I got a question. Yeah. I'm not debating your, I'm not doubting your numbers, Anton. You're a stand up guy. However, how do you know about investments that don't get announced? Because I've had inv investments yeah. that I haven't told you about. So, you sure, about? sure. Uh, uh, the thing about uh, Invest Game Report is that, of course, we track uh, and we are very much open about it. And you may read it uh, in the you know in the appendix section of the report that, of course, we track. We try to track all the deals with the disclosed value. So, when we count the deals. We count all the deals, right? All the deals that we uh, th that we have that are publicly available, that are available through like Capital IQ and all the special tools you have for that. Uh, but of course, you cannot keep the value for all the deals, right? Because lots of, especially lots of corporate deals, uh, have no disclosed value. So, but that's just what we have to deal with. So, uh, the actual numbers are of course bigger. Uh, but again, the major parts of the deals uh, have uh, disclosed value, so it like it provides you uh, quite um, no quite a picture. So you 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 have more uh, than enough to get the idea. Do you think we're going to continue to see the trend in blockchain investment this absolutely. year? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one uh, special thing about the report is that. Uh, our dear friends from Navic, <laughs> you might know them, <laughs> uh, especially Manu and Aaron, they, ha they are providing uh, special analysis of the blockchain, blockchain gaming section. Uh, they've done it for the second time now. So the first one was in, back in the Q1, Q3 uh, 2021 report. And so uh, it's a great uh, analysis. Uh, it's, of course, quite short. So it's only like two slides of the report. 
it's not as big as the you know special Navic reports on the blockchain gaming, but still, um, they do a great job of analyzing the you know the the sector, uh, the segment, and um, yeah, they have some unique ideas on what exactly brought uh, so much investors' attention to the segment, and um, you may find it uh, in the report, but I'll just say that. Um, the major deals that have contributed to this amazing growth, again, $3.1 billion of the disclosed value, uh, were, you know, provided, uh, by like Forte's astronomical 910 million, uh, I believe it was two rounds in 2021. Um, yeah. And also by, uh, you know, Sky Mavis investments and Mythical Games, 225 million. And the Sandbox raised additional uh, $93 million. So the uh, focus has shifted a lot. I mean, 26% of all the private placements, uh, I believe it speaks for itself. So yeah, I believe that we're going to see uh, way more investments in the blockchain section this year. But as has been... Uh, greatly put by uh, Manu in the report, back in the report, is that 2022 is going to be the year um, of tempering expectations. I love this expression by him. So uh, <laughs> uh, when 2021 was like the booming year, I believe that 2022 will still see uh, lots and lots of in, uh, VC money and we have just discussed that before the we started recording the po the podcast, but uh, 2022 saw way more VC funds, which are uh, solely concentrated on the blockchain section. So I believe that's one of the yeah one of the things that tell us that blockchain is going to be even going to attract even more capital. But again, uh, regulation, uh, game design, and uh, other issues are gonna like maybe not stop but maybe influence in some way uh on the uh on the segment yeah i was going to say you can predict how much investment is going to go into games on the blockchain side this year by looking at the funds that have been set up so this i'm quite close to that world and they speak a lot with those vcs and the the amount of funds being set up exclusively for blockchain and their 100 200 500 million dollar funds that are that have yet to invest in the game blockchain game sectors, but that's the money that they've taken is for that. That's what they've told their LPs. So, so you even if that hasn't happened yet, then it seems that given that they've taken that money and have told people that's what they're going to be doing with it, then assuming there's credible businesses to invest in, then you're going to see that happen. That's almost a certainty. Uh, Absolutely, because of the funds that have been set up. Absolutely, and talking about funds, uh, as I have just said. Um, so private investments saw uh, uh, like a double X growth in terms of the value, right? So it was uh, $12 billion in 2021 against uh, $5.9 billion back in 2020. So uh, we have this special rating of the top VCs and uh, it's top 15. And so it's uh, <laughs> the number one place is always uh, reserved for Bitcraft uh ventures so i believe you guys know about the fund and uh well of course it's not reserved they deserve that uh and with the with with a number of deals and the number of lead deals they do and the, uh, the the deal value they provide uh and we have calculated that in 2021 all these vc funds they have raised nearly 900 million dollars right of new money to invest and I do not know, uh, to be honest, how much of that money is going to be spent directly to blockchain, but I believe a significant part of that is going to be uh, directed to the segment. So yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, the number of funds and the, the amount of money they raise definitely tells us that blockchain gaming is going to see even more investments. Yeah, well, I think it holds an exciting year ahead of us. I can't wait to see what. I wonder whether or not uh, 
you know, does that map with the amount of people? Is the, the that great that growth that deal growth that you're describing? Does it correlate with the amount of people playing games? So more people play games year on year. You know, two and a half, three billion people, but it is um, increasing faster. Is it? I think it's probably increasing faster than the amount of people that are getting into games. So I just wonder whether that means, is there correlation to the fact that people are spending more money in games because those deals are getting bigger, despite the fact that the quantity of people is not increasing at that rate. Is there any correlation there? Have you ever think about that? All right. That's uh, First, that's a very good observation. And second, uh, I believe that at least partially, that's definitely correlated, right? Because gaming has been has got a lot of hype back in 2020 when the pandemic started. And, uh, uh, well, 2021 showed that gaming was uh, pandemic proof, right? Uh, is what they call it. Because uh, one, one of the industries, one of the sectors that uh, managed to not only uh, get way more money in 2020, but also keep that money, right? Uh, lots, of, lots of major players managed to meet expectations in 2021. And so gaming turns out to be a very, uh, well, not maybe very, but a secure way to keep your money uh, and to, you know, to, you know, to increase the amount of money you, you have. Um, so yeah, I'm not that sure that the growth, the audience growth of the global gaming uh, provides like way more money uh, for the gaming companies because as we have discussed with Roblox, all these new audiences are uh, very much, uh, they do appear in like the developing countries, right? right? Like India and uh, there's been lots of news about India and Africa recently and their investment, um, uh, what do you call it? Their investment uh, climate uh, and of course, they have lots of people who are ready to play, who want to play, and they they are now starting to get uh, devices and gadgets for gaming. But that does not necessarily mean that they have money enough to you know to continue boosting the the industry. So uh, back to your point, I do think that the rise of the audience numbers partially influences the amount of money which is poured into the gaming industry, but that's not the sole reason because obviously that's the investment for future. That's uh, the long shot, the long shot uh, game. And uh, I'm not like, I do not think that uh, all the VC funds and all the corporates players are expecting returns immediately. Yeah. When I was reading through, through the report, what was going through my mind um, I was thinking, what does all of this mean for people who work in the industry that don't directly are are not directly involved in these in these deals? David, you've been in the industry for for a long time. I was wondering, like, do you think we're going to see changes in behavior of what people expect from their salary package so that they can benefit more when their company gets acquired um, or has mm -hmm. private investment? Well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a correlation that I'd never seen. I mean, you would um, you would hope, would you wouldn't you, that the salary was would increase with the line of the value of the industry, but I don't think I, I think well, certainly it's a good business to be in um, if you work in the industry. I don't think that correlation between what people are seeing in their pay packet if they work in it versus how successful the industry is that's maybe not there. Uh, I would say that it's allowed many more. It's much employs that many more people. Uh, I think uh, there's certainly people that, uh, like the, the people, everybody that works in the company that I run, uh, sees some some equity in. So when if there is an exit in in the future for our company, then they would benefit from that. And I can well imagine a scenario where the the money they receive from that equity will end up being more than the salaries that they've taken in the time that they've worked here. So I do think it can be real. It has been in things that I've done in the past. Um, so I, I suppose that's uh, uh, an exciting thing to think about if you're working in, at a company where you get to see some equity of that company, yeah. And to add to, add to that, I, I, I will probably say that, uh, again, the 
you know, all this influx of new money uh, does not necessarily mean that like all the people who work there are going to get paid more, right? Because that's not exactly how, you know, the business side of it works. Uh, but again, uh, some, at least some part of that investment money is going to new startups, right? Like to new studios that uh, are emerging all over the place, like we are, the the Russian gaming industry has never seen so much money and so many new studios as in 2021 and 2020, and I believe this is uh, the same for like for other regions as well, right? Like Turkey, Finland, uh, so many new studios, right? So, but again, if you start up a new gaming studio, whatever blockchain or not blockchain or mobile or PC, whatever, uh, you start hiring, and when you hire. Uh, these new people, it does not necessarily mean that they're gonna get paid more. They're gonna they're gonna get paid, uh, uh, like they're gonna have some market uh, salary, not exactly uh, more than they did, but there are some other benefits to it, right? And of course, another thing that uh, we've been witnessing recently is that more and more people inside big companies are starting to get. Uh, concerned with the uh, with the you know with the uh, uh, with the salaries and with the benefits they get and with the working environment of the companies and we see way more news about strikes and all the um, uh, you know unions uh, being organized in the industry and I actually believe that this hype around gaming and uh, uh, this investment capital that uh, that as the, the industry has seen recently uh, has indirectly influenced that as well because people are seeing all these uh, new rounds of money and uh, these quarterly reports by Activision and Electronic Arts and Take Two and they are starting to ask themselves these questions right so they are they are thinking about improving the working environment and. Just today, there was uh, this news about Ubisoft uh, people, like uh, you know, launching some initiative uh, with a uh, two hundred days. Um, yeah, so I believe there there is an indirect influence to that. Okay, yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. I'm yeah, I'm personally keen to see how how that impacts the future. Because I was speaking with a, a friend who worked at a company that was, a gaming company that was acquired by Microsoft a long time ago. And uh, she was saying that the first question going around when the news broke out was whether they could keep using their MacBooks. And then no <laughs> one was able to concentrate for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so even yeah. small things like that can potentially impact the the productivity of the company and... Um, it's it's certainly an industry that's driven now because you're seeing an investment. If if you get take investments from a venture capitalist, then the nature of the the that business is that that venture capitalist doesn't take any money along the way. You know, maybe a different kind of business. If you ran a shoe shop, then you'd invested in a shoe shop, and then you would expect to see year on year some sort of dividend from that company. That's not the way investment works in the games industry. The only time that they see a return is when the company sells, or mm. historically. And so the whole thing is geared for sale. So any any company that takes venture capital is expected to sell at some point later down the line. And and I think it, you know to your point, I think Maria, I think it'd be great to. I'd like to think that every company is making sure that in that scenario, when that happens, then uh, teams that have really made that happen uh, remunerate you accordingly. Certainly, I would hope there's somebody joining that company that says, I'd imagine we're on this trajectory, therefore, what's in it for me when that day comes? And, and I, I think it would be difficult to hire great people without being able to offer something that, that benefits from them, uh, them in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, we're reaching the one hour mark, so I don't think we're going to be able to talk about Nintendo Direct because we had an excellent longer conversation about oh, Roblox. But, but that, you know, the sad thing about that is all we've talked about on this podcast is numbers. And, <laughs> you know, the Nintendo Direct is pure joy from beginning to end. Just a beautiful set of games that are all about fun. And we just like a bunch of business people just talk about boring numbers. What a shame. Oh, did you Nintendo watch? 
Nintendo doesn't deserve to be shoved into a 10 minute window at the end of yeah. a podcast. That's you know? a good way of putting it, I suppose. It, it, you know, what, what were you going to say, Maria? Oh, did you watch the the announcements? Were there any games that captured your your interest? Oh, you know, uh, which one? I mean, there was no New Zelda. That was a, sh- a shame, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I like the look of Kirby. That seems like it's shaken up well. Uh, shaping up well. What else did I like there? Fire Emblem, I thought looked solid. Oh, Advance Wars. Uh, I love Advance Wars, and it seems like a good version of that on Switch. Uh, I mean, there was just, I, I love, you know, if you cut me, I bleed Nintendo. And there's so many great games that they showed. It's like such a, uh, uh, such a strong announcement to me. Are you guys like... Name? I'm sorry, are you guys yeah. like uh, uh, like longtime Nintendo fans or not? Because I just got my Switch like last month, so I'm a super newbie to that. And uh, to be quite honest, I did not watch the latest Nintendo Direct. <laughs> and the only thing that I've played, the two things that I've uh, played in uh, on new, on Nintendo, is um, uh, this Russian RPG which is called Black Book. And I highly recommend it because it's uh, it's been localized into English, and it's a uh, it's like the Russian Witcher, but way oh. way low budget. But it's great. It's a COD based RPG, uh, so you should try that out. It's Black Book, and another thing is uh, the what what's that uh, Zaum game uh, f- uh, about detectives? What do you call it? Like the the narrative based uh, thing. I'm gonna. Anton, all the best games, look, here's my recommendation. If you just bought a Switch, then start with Nintendo First Party and then uh, specifically Nintendo Japan First Party, NCL, and work your way up from there and you won't go far wrong. And that will keep sure. you busy for like 10 years, I would think, right? <laughs> it's called Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium. You should all... Okay. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yes. I just these are the two games that I've played. Um, yeah, and uh, of course, I know about Zelda and I know about Mario and I know all about that. <laughs> but it just didn't happen yet. And so when you're talking about Nintendo Direct and all those Kirby and uh, Xenoblade and whatnot, and I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you're Xenoblade. late to the party, I should try that out. What do you think, Maria? Was there any, sorry, we, we're running out of time, aren't we? Oh, that, were there some highlights for you? I yeah. love Xenoblade Chronicles 3, ah. how it looked. <laughs> I unfortunately no longer have my Switch because I got a PlayStation 5 and I couldn't, I couldn't maintain my time. But now I'm, oh, why did I sell it? I should have yeah, kept I mean, it. And then sell um, a Nintendo system. There's always games for Nintendo. Yeah, I know. I'm just, it's just me. Um, I found Kirby so adorable <laughs> with the, what was it called? A mouthful mode or something like that? Like inhaling the traffic cones in the car. I just couldn't get over it. I squirmed. It was too it, cute. It's so fun. Yeah. yeah. Look at us all light up, you see. Our inner child comes out yeah. when we start to talk about these uh, these great games from Nintendo. Well, and others, right? On, on, you know, there's some great games from a lot of people in that uh, press conference. Yeah, it was lovely to have you three on the on the podcast. I think it was the first time you were all together. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, nice to be here. Let's uh, let's make sure. Let's mix up some of these games topics. In amongst the numbers, because it's a, a sea of numbers, I get lost sometimes. So yeah. let's be sure to do that. But great to get a lot of detail on it. They're very big numbers as well to take in. <laughs> well, if so, um, oh sorry, no, I just want to say that uh, if uh, the next time uh, I'm on the podcast, uh, it's it, it, and it's not about the report, another one, <laughs> then uh, we may be there may be less numbers, David. So. Hey, let me give let me give you a plug, Anton. Where where would people get that report? Uh, I believe the link is gonna be at the description. Yes, uh, yes. Maybe not, to the but website. I can. I've also dropped the link to the Slack uh, thing we have, and uh, I can send it to you directly if you want. Or cool. I can just send you the PDF. Uh, so to skip the all the registration thing. Hey, I mean for the for the listeners <laughs> is my point. <laughs> yeah, the, the the link to the website will be in the show notes. And the Metacast is brought to you by Navic. And I know we didn't have time to talk about Nintendo Direct, but if you want to talk about it, you can join Navic's Discord. We're we're there, and we can continue the conversation then. And please do let us know your your feedback. You have my email in the show notes, and I'd love to hear from you. 
So I think we'll wrap up and thank you for joining. Look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. 